Art. Um, my name is Dr. Sapna Verma. I'm a consultant paediatrician here in Dubai, and it gives me great pleasure in presenting our first uh, lecturer post lunch, uh, Dr. Imad Yassin, who gave us a fantastic presentation on ticks yesterday. He is the current uh, head of neurology at Kids Heart uh, Abu Dhabi. Um, and for the purposes of this session, we will, we've got uh, three lectures and we will take questions after the, the end of the three sessions. So without further ado, I will hand you over. This year? Okay, thank you, doc Dr. Sapna, for the nice introduction. Because of the time, I have, I think, 20 minutes uh, and have some few videos to show, so we'll, we'll start. I have nothing to disclose. Uh, William Osler once said one rule of thumb. Listen to your patient, he's telling you the diagnosis. And actually, this is very important. Uh, especially for pediatricians, uh, you're going mostly to listen to, your, to the parents of the patient in many cases, especially the child is young. So, and especially mothers. Mothers usually give the diagnosis because the, the mother usually is the closest person with, with the child. So take attention and to the mothers what she's saying. Another for the general pediatrician issue that early referral to appropriate subspeciality is very important. I wrote it in many uh, languages. Uh, give the bread dough to the baker even if he eats half of it. I don't believe half of it is too much, but anyhow, you have to go to the specialist, subspeciality. So early referral to appropriate subspeciality from generalist to specialist can lead to improved patient outcomes, as well as the decreased cost through optimal use of physician, hospital, and laboratory services. So we'll go for the first clinical scenario. This is one of my patients when I worked in Tawam Hospital. She's a, 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 a girl, a born normal, vertex delivery, full term. Upgar score was normal. The patient discharged from the hospital in good condition, readmitted in Tawam Hospital on the third day because she manifested three cyanotic spells, according to the parents, with apnea and clonic movements of the upper ex extremities every 10 minutes and lasting between one and two minutes each. So the, during the first day of admission in the hospital, a fourth attack was observed by a nurse. It included clonic movements of both upper limbs, and associated with apnea and cyanosis for one minute. The attacks cease spontaneously. So this is a video of a similar patient. If you see the tonic movements, what is clear most on the upper limbs, but also in the lower limbs if you look, and look to the eyes also. There is some also movements and clonic movements. So clinically, the patient demonstrated no abnormal facial features. Everything was normal, vital signs normal, basic laboratory tests, cerebrospinal fluid uh, normal, MRI, and uh, repeated interictal EGs were normal. And the family history was very positive, and this is very important to take family history. So as you see here, two of the siblings have the Caesar. Doesn't show here, anyhow. Uh, and also paternal cousins has, has some seizures in the past. So the infant was monitored up to the four years. So I monitored this patient for the development, no further seizures and normal motor and cognitive development. So what's your opinion? Any further investigations? So we did, did almost everything, cerebrospinal fluid, MRI, ultrasound, everything, 
normal development. So what's your opinion? Anybody? Not neurologist? Sorry? I can't hear you. Where are you? My clonus? No, no, but before you diagnose, do you need any other investigation or not? EG done, interactal many times, normal, I mentioned. So if you do everything, you do genetics. So the genetics showed potassium channel Q2 gene of the propan and members of the heart family. So we do it for the, for the child, for the baby, and for the parents and a deletion of an adenine, adenine nucleotide in exon 9 uh, predicting a cause of frame shift in the protein. The mutation is a single nucleotide del deletion. It's classified as pathogenic variant, and the mutation has not been previously described. And I believe this is the first case in, uh, in, in this patient. So this is the deletion chromatogram of the deletion. So what's your opinion? Now we have a a baby, a neonate, who have a familial, family history, and the course is benign, so I will help you. Benign, familial, neonatal, and has the patient, what is the problem with the patients? Caesar or epilepsy. So benign, familial, neonatal, epilepsy. Now it's called self-limited every time they are changing because they found that it's not so benign, but anyhow. So benign familial neonatal epilepsy. Few words about benign familial neonatal epilepsy. How many times, okay, have. So neonatal onset, typically on the second or third day, results by about six months. Development should be normal. Febrile or afebrile seizure later in life are reported only in 15% of cases. There are two major mutations. Mutation in potassium channel Q2, which is the most of the mutation, more than 80%, and rarely in potassium channel Q3. I have one patient not yet published in potassium channel Q3. So we published this many, many years ago. Oh, with uh, Professor uh, uh, Lihad al-Ghazali and with Professor Bassam Ali. And these are the, pro the professors. So we go to the second scenario. So this is a male infant developed a cluster for focal seizure at the age of six months. So during infantile period, which occurred during wake and sleep in form of non-motor onset with impaired awareness, eye deviation for about one to three minutes, and aborted spontaneously. This, this patient also published, that's why it has to write this. Yeah, so this is a video home video from one of the parents, and this is the importance of home video. And if you see here, there is paucity of movements. This is what we, we call it now uh, motor unaware. So the child is looking to one side, there is paucity of movements, barely he's, he's moving. If you see it again here. Just deviation, there is no convulsions. So not every seizure has convulsions, especially in younger children where there's no, myelination is still not formed. Okay, so ictal EG recording showed right parietal occipital sharp waves, interictal was normal, brain MRI unremarkable, and development also, and neurological examination was normal. So always we start up about the family. Family, we have also here pater, uh, the father and uh, a paternal uncle with Caesar at the age of eight and 10 months respectively and resolved spontaneously later on. 
the patient was started on anti-epileptic drugs and followed up up to the five years of age. I followed this patient up to the five years of age. Everything is normal, no more seizure, normal development. Any further investigations, please? We did everything. What is remaining? Genetics, very good. So genetic test showed mutation analysis of sodium for, for sodium channel 2A uh, a novel heterozygous, heterozygous mutation was found, and the mutation leads to substitution of aspirate gene with lysine. So what's your opinion? Now we have a benign course, infantile, familiar, very good. What is the problem with the child? Caesars. So benign, self-limited, familial, infantile, Caesar. So we, we published also, this is many years ago, don't tell me when, it's benign, familiar, and non-familial infantile seizures, which I called, the first person to call this, Fukuyama Watanabe Vejavano syndrome. We studied about 14 cases from Saudi Arabia. This is uh, Professor Vejavano, he's Italian, this is in Venice. And this is also Professor Fukuyama, late Professor Fukuyama, died many years ago, who who published many, many years ago, since 1963, Fukuyama, these Caesars. Clinical scenario three. So 10-month-old girl presented with five-minute generalized tonic Caesars associated with mild gastroenteritis of two days duration. There's no dehydration, this is very important, and Caesar subsided without any Caesar medication. Everything is normal, blood glucose, electrolytes, uh, uh, L, uh, CBC, uh, stool microscopy sh showed uh, no past cells, culture normal. The only thing is rotavirus, isolated. Uh, EG and MRI were normal, development also normal, no recurrence of seizures on development, and I followed him up to 40, 48 months of age. So what's your opinion here? Again, we have a benign course, and during infancy, and the patient has seizure, associated with what? Mild gastroenteritis. So benign infantile seizures with mild gastroenteritis. So we published this also many years ago. For the first time in Saudi Arabia, electroclinical features of benign infantile seizures with mild gastroenteritis. And I have collected about uh, 25 patients. Other people also uh, publish similar uh, patients. So, few words about benign infantile seizures, mild gastroenteritis, characterized by occurrence in infancy between four and 30 months with normal psychomotor development and neurological examination. Seizures may be focal or generalized, usually brief, repetitive, and in clusters, but can be isolated, associated with mild gastroenteritis, which does not cause dehydration or electrolyte imbalance. Associated with low grade fever or absent fever, not associated with electrolyte derangement or hypoglycemia, a normal CSF, normal interictal EG and brain imaging, and a benign course. The fourth clinical scenario, this is a six-year-old boy presented to our hospital with severe thrombocytopenia, and this is a very good lesson for general pediatricians. Uh, the patient was managed for a long time. Five years, this patient was treated at chronic idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. What, what do you give for ITP, chronic ITP? What is the treatment? Immunoglobulins, correct? Yeah. So this patient admitted only for chronic every time they're doing it, no bone marrow at all done. This patient, if you look from him, you should put the diagnosis immediately when I saw him for the first time in the clinic. He has skin manifestations, something called lacy reticular pigmentation, nail dystrophies, alopecia, he has no hair at all, and you have to look to the mouth always, please, even for a normal child always make it uh, something which is used. Oral leukoplakia, 
microcephaly, mental retardation, or intellectual disability. Condition associated with necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis. Bone marrow aspirate showed a picture of aplastic anemia, so we did that one. And the age of 10 years developed pancytopenia. Unfortunately, I was not absent at that time. He died of, of fulminant sepsis at the age of 14 years. He was a very nice child. So this is the picture. You have, they have the dystrophic nails, they have the reticular pigmentation, and the, they have this here, the, the, the leukoplakia, and the uh, glossitis and gingivitis. So what's your opinion? Spot diagnosis? It's a bit difficult because it's rare. It is a case of dyskeratosis congenita. So the first, we published this is for first patient in Saudi Arabia, an uncommon genodermatosis. Few words about this keratosis congenita. is a rare genodermatosis. It is a multi-system disorder, has reticular, reticulated hyperpigmentation, nail dystrophy, mucous membrane, lesions, ulcers, pre-malignant oral leukoplakia, and progressive pancytopenia. It is a, it is a disorder of poor telomere maintenance, mainly due a number of gene mutations that give rise to abnormal ribosome function, and it's called ribosomopathy. The disease is related to one or more mutations directly or indirectly affect the vertebrate telomere RNA. It is a rare genetic form of bone marrow failure. There are many subdivisions. Uh, some of them are autosomal dominant, some of them are recessive. The most common is sex-linked. It's called Zinsser called Engelmann syndrome, and there are many other syndromes. I think I finish. We'll go to the last scenario, which is more difficult, and I want a spot diagnosis, please. And Dr. Suleiman will give a praise or a, a gift for who, the one who give the correct answer. Diagnosis? Sorry? Raise, raise up and tell. Raise up. Very good. This is my granddaughter dancing. Thank you. Mart's got to go fairly quickly. So in, as we've got a little bit of time, we're going to take questions um, directed to Dr. Emad sort of straight after this session. So any questions for him, we will provide you with a microphone. And please, easy questions, <laughs> especially from neurologists. Dr. Okay. Rashid, and be careful. Okay. Easy questions, simple questions, Salaam no questions, alhamdulillah. Uh, Salaam ah, alaikum. Okay. I just have uh, your opinion regarding the fever and seizure above six years. We have it a lot of very very common this, year, this month with influenza. I can't hear you well. Do you hear how well? Um, I'm asking regarding your opinion regarding recommendation for patients fever and seizure above six years. Fever. Above six years. And we have a focus like influenza A or another virus, but it's above six years. So it's not febrile seizure. So what is your recommendation? Very good. Very good questions. Although it is a bit difficult, I told you easy. Um, so above five years, some people six years, this is goes beyond the febrile seizures. So there's a, an entity called seizure with fever, triggered by fever. So any child beyond this five years, or sometimes six years, you have to investigate for epilepsy. You know, febrile seizure, it is non-epileptic syndrome. That means it's not coming from the brain, correct? So if you do an EEG, it should be normal, especially an ictal EEG. Anybody knows what is ictal EEG? Ictal EEG? During? Yeah, very good. You are very smart. So ictal EEG, during the EEG, the child is convulsing or have a seizure. If you do it, it should be normal for febrile seizure or any other, non, I mean, non-epileptic seizure. So a patient who is no, there is seizure beyond the
febrile seizure age should be investigated for epilepsy. Did I answer your question? Sorry? Does he require what? Lumbar puncture. Lumbar puncture, of course, if you suspect, you suspect encephalitis, meningitis, this depends on your clinical picture. If it crosses your mind, you have to do it. Of course, junior people will do it for everybody. When I've been younger and called for this, I don't go quickly, I have to judge. If the child is happy and and he's a normal child, has no any signs, I will not go to LP, even if it's febrile. But unless it crosses my mind, the child is looking apathetic, he's not well, irritable, and so on, and you suspect any encephalitis, encephalitis or meningitis, you have to do LP, of course. Any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Ayman. I have a question about the case with a patient with seizure and mild gastroenteritis. So in this case, is a normal EEG enough to, um, to decide that this is benign and there is no chance for recurrence? Sorry, the, the diagnosis, I think this is entity is underdiagnosed. The criteria is, as I showed here, a child who developing a seizure during a mild gastroenteritis. So this is enough for the criteria. Yeah. One of the criteria that this child should be a normal child with normal development and normal neurological examination. And sh everything should be normal. There is no dehydration, no electrolyte imbalance. MRI, if you want to do it, of course we don't do it for every child, but if you want or you are suspecting it should be normal, EG, ictal and interictal should be normal. So the diagnosis depends on two entities, a seizure during a mild gastroenteritis, and you, you, you did uh, stool analysis, and you find some of these viruses, especially rotaviruses, then you can publish that one. Thank you. Okay. So we'll finish the question. We'll, next questions we'll take at the end of session. Now I welcome Dr. Entesar Alamdi. She is here.